Oh, so you've probably seen it as you came in. Pastor Dirk and Penny are on holidays for three weeks and just wave them in case they're watching. So um, be back and yeah, I introduce to you our guest speakers, Pastor Rob and Joy Edwards. And so Joy come up as well. Just so we've connected probably 10 years at least. You know, you were in Rockhampton. Yeah. So um, they're now in Gatton, so right next door, and brought a few people up here as well for today, I think. We didn't, we didn't bring uh, them. But. Uh, just, uh, so, uh, you know how, how I could tell they're from the lock here? They, they think it's cold? No, yes. no, no, no. They forgot their jumper. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's warmer down there. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I, I may just pray for you. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for Rob and Joy. Thank you for the journey that you've had them on as they've walked with you. Lord, I pray that this morning they, you fill them with your spirit, make them completely free, and what you put on their heart, Lord, I pray they will share freely this morning, and we will hear it and receive it in your name. Amen. Hello. There we go. <laughs> um, so good morning, everybody. It is a great privilege to be here this morning to talk about something that's very dear to my heart, and that is the topic of angels. And I thank Edgar very much for um, having this, this privilege to just talk to you for a few minutes this morning. About 10 years ago, I was talking to my mum... And she said to me, oh, I've probably had oh, four or five experiences of angels in my life and, and, and a couple of visions. You know, we were just chatting this one day. At that time, she was about 75. And I asked her if she'd ever told anybody about that. And she said, no, no, I've, I've never bothered to. And, and people would probably think I was a little bit crazy or something if I did. And I said, well, would you tell me? So she did. She told me these experiences. And I said, they are so beautiful and so precious. Would you write them down? So she did. She wrote them down. And then I thought, hang on a minute. If she's had like five or six experiences, maybe other people have had, I don't know, one. So then I started asking around. And it didn't matter where I was or who I was with. Either they had had an experience themselves or they knew of somebody else who did. So then I started recording them. I thought, I don't really know what I'll do with these, but maybe something one day. Anyway, that has actually culminated now in a book called Angels Are Here, which some of you might have noticed on a table outside. This is now a compila compilation of 87 stories from 66 different people. Um, Dirk Wilner's got a story in there and, and um, Mandy has a story in there. Um, Rob and myself and uh, people from all over Australia, some pastors, some family members, uh, some children, um, some people from East Timor have stories in there. Um, they're all true, of course. <laughs> Uh, I started actually just with collecting angel stories, but then other people gave me uh, examples of visions that they'd had, so I thought I'll call it angels and visions. And then there were some that didn't fit into either category, so it sort of became an other section. Um, and I couldn't miss any of them out because they were all so precious. So this book is available for sale. It's only $20, um, but the wonderful thing about it is that it kind of becomes a bit contagious. So I've sold books to people who have then said, oh yeah, we were reading this, I was reading this book to my family yesterday and, and then they started talking about experiences that they'd had with God and, and it sort of spreads and it's just pretty special. Another really big plus is that all of the profits from the sale of this book are going to Australian Lutheran World Service. I figured that it's 66 people's book. It's not my book. Um, and so the money is going to charity. And so far we've raised enough money to build half a dam 
in Cambodia. So we're halfway there already, which has been really, really exciting. And so now, now we really need the other half. And now we really need the other half. So <laughs> it's $5,000 for a dam. We've raised already $2,500 uh, from the sales of the book. And um, I'd strongly encourage you to buy one for yourself or for your friends or, or as in the case of my mother who now can't see very well, um, her friend is reading them to her. And that's been a really precious thing as well. So uh, if you don't have $20 on you this morning, it absolutely doesn't matter. I've got an order sheet out there, uh, or else you can do internet banking or anything that you like, but um, they'll be for sale there. And I can always order more, so feel welcome to buy one and be blessed. Well, while you're here, you might as well read a story. Oh, okay. Uh, I just have to get my glasses. <laughs> okay, I was going to use her as a, as a sermon illustration, but while she's here, then, then she doesn't have to get up again. And that's points for me, you see. <laughs> All right. So this one is called Rescued by an Angel. And this is from a lady by the name of Fiona Muller. She lives in Henty, New South Wales. Our fourth child, Vashti, was born on the 14th of March 2001. Life was hectic. Not only were there four children under the age of five to care for but I was also helping to run our family property as well as being actively involved in church and community work. The drought years had begun and the temperature was still quite warm for that time of year. I was sitting outside under our back veranda breastfeeding Vashti, the new baby I had just brought home from the hospital. My mother Ruth was also there and we were chatting away while watching the other kids play. When the workman turned up to work on a building project, I decided to go back into the house to finish feeding Vashti. Ruth and I would have only been inside for about 15 minutes when two completely wet and muddy children, Rachel 4 and Tyson 2, walked in. As a mother, I instantly thought the worst, as we have a very large, deep dam along our so alongside our home for garden and stock water. A wave of panic came over me. Even though my children were safe, I could not help thinking about what could so easily have been. It took me over an hour to calm down and actually hear what they were trying to explain about what had happened to them. In her simple child language, this is what Rachel said. Mummy, a big white ghoster with big wings and a big sword told us to get out of the dam and go back home. He was very big and helped us get out of the water. This she repeated over and over again. It seemed she needed to do this so that I would actually stop and listen to the amazing miracle that had just occurred. My husband and I believed that either Jesus or an angel were there that day with our children. I got Rachel to draw a picture of what she'd seen and it continues to hang framed in her room as a reminder of the fact that God's protection is very real in our lives today. Now, while you may be tempted to think that one of the workmen must have rescued our children, we know that was not possible as they were on the top of the cottage roof that was being built at the time. Their father, Neil, and Greg were in the machinery shed. Nobody took any notice of the children wandering off. The picture that Rachel drew does not show builders. If the builders had pulled her and her brother from the dam, I'm sure they would have let us know that it was them. Also, when we questioned the builders later, they had no idea of the incident. I believe it is so easy, especially as adults, to shut out the supernatural realm and operate from an earthly perspective. But we as a family have experienced so many more supernatural incidents since Ra Rachel's angel experience that we have no doubt that God is real and active. We are always excited to see the amazing things he does in the lives of people around us. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Psalm 91, verse 11. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joy. And lots of other nice little stories like that too. Um, so I'm delivering a message on angels to tell you about some angels. Not some angels, to tell you about 
angels. Let's look at the topic of angels. Uh, you know, when, you, when something's... Like, I've been really looking forward to this. It's, it's really exciting stuff. To go preaching in some other place is, is good, but I think preaching in your church is... Uh, I find that to be thoroughly excellent because it's really good to... Um, I shouldn't say anything comparative, um, OK? But uh, you get the message. It's good to be here. Um, yeah, and so with that kind of excitement building, I found that last night uh, you invaded my dreams. And you know when you're, when you're preparing to do something and you dream about it the night before, you don't know that all of it makes sense. You can actually, during the dream, think that this is the real thing. You know, this is, and it's happened to me before that God has delivered complete messages to me while I dreamt and I get up on Sunday morning knowing that the sermon that I had prepared was not the one I was going to preach because God had given me a new one during my dream and you just have to, have to hope like crazy you weren't preach dream, uh, dream preaching and it was actually a vision because there's a difference. Uh, and uh, so, but I should try that out because during my dream preaching, I had to tell everyone to change their passwords. That, that doesn't sound very prophetic, does it? No, no, when I, when I say it, it's not really there. But maybe there's someone here who needs to, so if that's from God to you, then, then, <laughs> then there it is. Uh, but uh, during my dream preaching, a song kept going, you know, where you get earworms, you know, and they keep going, and this uh, was keeping me awake. Uh, so I was no longer dream preaching, but then I woke up, and so this song kept me awake, and I had to get up two or three times, and Joy was probably annoyed with me. I don't know, she's probably used to sleeping through my antics now. But the song was... Not that one that you just sang, but it was those same words, because I didn't know that song. Right? That's a newie on me. Um, but it was the one by Zach Williams uh, with that same passage, you know, about the dry bones. And, um, you know, and I called to the four winds and, and, uh, and, and then the, that, and speak to the bones, son of man, that they will live. And so that's not a very you know, sleep-producing song, is it? So that was going through my head. So may I call life into your, into your lives. May I call you out that you may live today. All right, now that's off my chest. Um, I want to pray a little prayer of, for listening today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, we, we ask that you preach to us as I speak. We ask that you open our hearts to receive your word, that we may live. And, uh, and so today, I cast a spirit of understanding over you, that you may hear, that you may see, and, uh, and that God may reveal to you that which needs to be revealed. Amen. Uh, I love the topic of angels. Now, I've got some, uh, some overheads there. If, how did we go with them? Did they work? Yeah, there we go. There's my title page. Angels, what are they, what are they doing? Seeing angels. Um, it's all good fun. Right, the next, next slide. You know, stereotypically, we get these angels, angel pictures, you know, of, of cheruby baby little thingies uh, that, that sort of float around and play harps and stuff like that. I don't know where they get that from because it's not scriptural. There's a statue of an angel uh, looking quite angelic. Probably our next slide gives us a more biblical, biblically realistic kind of look um, and maybe the next one. Look at that. What's that? I um, never really had a great deal of interest in angels per se. Yes, you know, as part of uh, stories and things, like part of the Christmas story and all of that kind of thing. And when you think about it, they're everywhere in Scripture. But, uh, you know, personally, I didn't, I didn't seek seeing angels. I didn't think it was a big part of our life. It had never been part of my seminary training. It had never been part of my... Uh, 
my faith practice or anything like that. Uh, until one day I was preaching in a fairly small group and there was a guy sitting fairly close to the front and he was looking at me wide-eyed. And I thought, man, I'm preaching up a storm here. I am really doing really well. <laughs> and this, this guy was just looking at me and, and, I th and so... You know, that encourages you a bit when, you know, someone sort of, you know, fix their gaze on you. And, and not that I, you all have to do that now, but um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really... And so I'm, I'm, I'm getting into it a bit, you know, and moving around a bit and getting more, a little bit more animated. Well, he came to me afterwards and he said uh, that behind me was a huge angel tracking every move I made. When I stepped, it stepped behind me. And when I moved over this way, it moved in the same way behind me, this huge angel behind me. I said, oh. So, like a big, you know, big thing, person, was it? He said, yeah, in full armour. Now, that's not something that you get out of a storybook, is it? That's not in your Sunday school books, angels in full armour. And so, I thought, well, you know, wow, this, that's... Amazing. I didn't actually ask him if he heard a word I said, but I would, I would understand if he didn't. Because that was a, you know, and I thought, oh, I wish I could see angels. That would be fantastic, you know. And so that's why I grabbed that picture, because it's, it's uh, probably a little more realistic. Well, for mine, anyway. Um, how do you think that affects me now? knowing that in all likelihood, see, I can't, I can't see it, but in all likelihood, I've probably got some sort of nine-foot-tall angel in full armour backing up everything I say. That's with me in ministry. So I'm thinking, now, theologically, yes, I know this ministry isn't mine. I'm here as a as a tool of God. Um, so that makes sense. So now maybe I'm, I need to get a little bit more realistic about my ministry. Well, why don't we speak more? Next slide, please. Why don't we speak more about angels? You know, we've got this quote from Luther about angels. If you Google Luther and angels, this is what you'll get, right? From the beginning of my Reformation, I've asked God to send me neither dreams nor visions nor angels, but to give me the right understanding of his word and the Holy Scriptures for as long as I have God's word, I know that I am walking in his way and that I shall not fall into error or delusion. That quote is so, so well quoted from Luther that it's even got its own little graphic. You can find it nicely framed in all sorts of places. That's not all he said, about angels. In fact, he said so much more. If you flick over the next one, there's a bit of a pricey of a few things that, uh, that Luther said. He said, the, the acknowledgement of angels is needful in the church. Therefore, godly preachers should teach them logically. First, they should show what angels are, namely spiritual creatures without bodies. Not 100% sure I agree with him there. Actually, I don't agree with him there because angels... Do have, in scripture they turned up and people thought they were peop people you know and they fed them um, secondly what manner of spirits they are namely good spirits and not evil They're, and here evil spirits must also be spoken of I've tr uh, trimmed this back a fair bit because Luther is much more vociferous than that about things thirdly they must speak touching their function which is the as the epistle Hebrews to the Hebrews says. So, why don't we find them in nice little pretty graphics? We don't. You've got to look them up yourself and you've got to... It stacks more. But anyway, he says that, that preachers, that pastors, should preach about angels and teach people about them. So, here I go. Not that Luther said it, but uh, because the Word says it. Um, he will command his, his angels concerning you. There's so much more about angels in scriptures. They're, they're in everything. You know, the, 
minister there at the uh, Annunciation of Mary. It was an angel. Um, you know, in the uh, uh, when we're talking about who uh, who spoke of the resurrection first, it was an angel. There was uh, we went to the Mugger Passion Play, and um, I don't know if anyone seen that. Mugger, yeah, some of you are going. What what language is he speaking now? But there's um, this Passion Play. It's put on by volunteers. It's fantastic, and they had the uh, you know Jesus in the tomb, and it goes all dark, and then there's this angel, this guy dressed up as an angel, walking slowly toward the tomb. And I think, yeah, you know, when you see it played out like that, something like that must have happened. That, you know, when they first came across the, um, the resurrection, the stone was rolled away and there was an angel sitting there, or two, I can't remember. Um, they were there. They were right there. They, they're at the centre of everything big. Even the Garden of Eden, you see angels with swords blocking the, the way. They're, they're there throughout from beginning to end. And in the end, the angels will come and separate the uh, good from the bad. Angels there. They're, they're there uh, right from the story, from, from Genesis to end of Revelation. Right there, all, th all throughout every um, major event in the Christian life. Um, what else was I going to tell you? Lots of Luther stuff. Um, when, we, when we depict angels and, when we, and we look at what they do, and what their purpose is. I think we do ourselves a disservice when we think in terms of, um, of church just being the, all of the physical, earthly stuff we do. We know it's spiritual. We know there's lots of spiritual things that go on. But sometimes we don't name it particularly all of those things that happened. Like we are talking about this morning, you know, the, the impact on worship of having the influence of the demonic sneaking into our worship. Um, now, that's something we need to be continually aware of because it's always going to happen. Where are demons? Demons are active in the church. And there's no point trying to get rid of them all. Um, it's just not going to happen. Um, well, I mean, it may happen, but Why? You know, if you get rid of them, they go and only go and annoy someone else who has no defence. Uh, so you're probably better off, you know, tying them up and putting them in the corner rather than trying to expel them completely. There's nothing worse for a demon. That would be hell for them to be stuck around worship where they could have no impact and where everything they tried to do, they kept getting foible, foiled, not foibled, foiled and cast into a corner. I mean, that'd be, that'd be terrible for your, your uh, um, sense of self-esteem, wouldn't it, to be constantly cast out all the time, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's, um, that's our purpose as the people of God, is to, to, give the, is, is to speak into the realm of, of the Spirit. We are called to speak into the realm of the Spirit and to, um, to have an impact there. When, uh, when I spoke with Clark Taylor about this when, I, when he was up here and I spoke with him and he said to me, you've got to build it, build it in the spirit before you can build it in the natural. I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> I thought, yes, okay, that sounds good, sounds right, but how does that work? How, how do you work that? And when I discovered the realm of the spirit, well, when that, not that I discovered it, it was, we all knew it was there, but when that began to become more open to me, I started to realise how we do that. We can speak into the spiritual realm and that will have an impact in the physical realm. All right, so angels. 
How can we get amongst it? Wouldn't it be wouldn't it be nice to see angels? Would you like to see angels? Yeah. Do, do people does does anyone here see angels in any form? Okay. All right. There's a few who see them. Yeah. Yeah. Um Who has ever seen an angel? Okay, so it's it's a reasonable number. Yeah. Who um, who among you are certain that there are an, that there are angels around? Just put your hand up if you are certain that there are angels around. Right. You, okay. So we I don't have to I don't have to argue with you about that. <laughs> um, you know, God says there are angels around. We've got all of those uh, uh, scriptural things ab about it, um, pointing to that. Um, and the, I think the big question in our society, you, you probably even go outside of the church and more people probably believe in angels than believe in Jesus Christ, you know. But, uh, but it's just the form of these angels and what they do, I think, is that's what we need to nail down. Because uh, while a lot of people may believe in angels and, and even recognise they're around and even seen them, uh, they're not all thoroughly aware of why they're there and their purpose and what, what we should do about that. Um, see, now we know what to do with demons, don't we? Right? Rack off. Fine, that's, that's pretty much, that's pretty easy, yeah. right? And probably add, in Jesus' name, rack off, but, um, <laughs> because otherwise you're just going in your own strength. But, so, so we know what to do with demons. We know they're bad, and we know that we want them gone. Now, probably some are a little more difficult than others because, you know, there's that whole area of, of your action um, impacts what the demon does, and you can give evil spirits greater permission in your life by what you say and do. So, you know, th th that complicates the issue a bit. So sometimes you need a bit of help with that. But essentially, we know that go should, as soon as possible, as far as possible, right? That's what we know. Angels are a little bit trickier. We say, well, yeah, angels would be nice. I uh, don't know why, but... Sounds good, just that, you know, we hear about them in Scripture and they sound so nice. Or we see them in stories and that would be nice, wouldn't it? But then what would, what would you do with an angel if you had one? You know, um, now I think right up front, let's, let's say very categorically and clearly that if you can't see angels, you're not some kind of second-rate Christian. Right, that's... Um, Seeing in the spirit is something that, uh, that you know, it's a gift um, and uh, seeing into the spiritual realm is something that we can't necessarily do. And we've got hundreds of years of history being in the West with this scientific worldview which has disabled us from being able to see it in, uh, in a spiritual way. We've sort of lost that. It's gone so far from our culture that it's, you know, we we see it, algebra as much more making much more sense than seeing in the spirit. Um, other cultures not so. You know, Papua New Guinean culture, for example, they would, you know, we we wouldn't be having this kind of lower level discussion. We really just oh yeah, seeing in the spirit, fine. Yeah. We know that. Yeah, there's four demons in the corner and two angels over there, and they say, "What's the deal?" You know, there's there's no argument. Um, but uh, but in our Western culture, we have difficulty in seeing. So there's a lot of unlearning that we would need to do before we even start getting to being able to see. And that can take some kind of miraculous Jesus invention, uh, invention intervention. Let's put all the syllables in there um, to. Uh, to bring us to a place of being able to see. 
Um, but even in saying that, I shouldn't just leave you with a whole list of excuses why you can't do it. Let's give you ways you can. Okay? Who would like to see an angel? Good. Well, so would I. I don't, I don't see them with my eyes. I see them with my spirit. And I, I guess that's a, that's a way. Let's spend a little bit of time in giving you some encouragement about how you might begin to operate in the realm of the spirit. Um, have you ever asked God to f help you find your keys? Yeah, put your, let's show of hands. Key prayers, right? I would encourage you to do that because, look, um, I was talking with uh, John Alley about this. I don't know if you know much. You've, you've, you've met John? Okay. Oh, he's been down here, hasn't he? Right. I was talking with John Alley about this and he's convinced that God uses praying for our keys as, a, as like prayer kindergarten <laughs> because it's so easy and measurable. It's small and, and we're willing to pray for that. You know, we, we pray with much more fear and prepida, prepida, you know, terror um, <laughs> about healing for cancer. Now, why should we do that? Why should we fear that? And yet we pray for our keys with gay abandon. Um, but that's, that's what we do. We, we don't, you know, we don't put so many, you know, caveats and, and ifs and maybes when we're praying for our keys. We just want our keys... Because we want our keys, that's all. God, where are my keys? I think I'm going mad. What happens then? What happens when you pray for your keys? Yeah, you start looking. What happens though? You have ideas. Yep. You get sort of a direction, don't you? It's like God says, but you don't want to. You don't want to say that God is speaking to you because that would be conceited. But uh, you sort of think. They're over there. And you go over there and there they are. I had a wonderful day in my shed one day. I had this day off and my shed was chock-a-block full. I had an old car there that I'd pulled apart and things like that and I finally got a day in my shed where I could pull this car apart. And it occurred to me that, you know how 10 millimetre sockets are the hardest things on earth to find? <laughs> I saw a, a new set of 10, 10 millimetre sockets. There were four 10 millimetre sockets and there was this in this uh, um, packet and on the packet was a warning. Warning, contents will disappear as soon as the package is open, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'm there looking and I say, this day in my shed, I'm going to just ask God where everything is and I'm not going to pick up a spanner unless God tells me where it is. I had this wonderful day in the shed where God led me to every spanner, every nut and bolt, everything I was looking for. I had a sense where it was. It was just a little thing. It, it hasn't happened so much since, but on that day, it was just a wonderful thing. It was prayer kindergarten. God, God does that for us. Well, it's exactly the same thing. You know that try and filter out, you know, when you, in your prayer life, Start praying for your keys, pray for other stuff, pray for other things, pray for a car park, pray all of these things. What is that thing that says that's where the car park is? What is that thing that says that's where your keys are? Try and focus on that, not so much your keys now, focus on that particular individual little feeling, that, that prompting that is in you when that happens. And that's the voice of the Lord. That's because God is wanting you to hear his voice. He, he's desirous of this to happen. And this is how he's training you. So go down that path. Try other things. Try and find other things. Don't try and find gold. Right? That, that just, God will say, no, don't. Just, you're playing with me now. Just you know, get serious. right? But um, unless he calls you to. But... And then when you get to know that voice, it's the same kind of little voice, it's the same kind of prompting that will open, because it's not actually a, a prayer voice you're actually seeing in the realm of the spirit. 
That's where it is. It's in that little spot. That's the window that God is trying to open for you. So, and down that road, there be angels. Down that path in prayer, down that path in listening to God, down that path in that window to the Spirit, that's where you'll find God showing you other things too. Like where there's evil, where there's holiness, where there's righteousness, where there's somebody who needs your help, who to pray for. And standing next to that person, you'll see an angel. Not see, but see in your heart. If you don't see them, it doesn't matter, but that's the muscles that we use to, to see. Um, and it's funny how different situations will open up different... You know, it's not the same all the time. It's not the same imagining. And so, it, you know, it can't be the same thing. I don't always see a line-up of angels like out in the foyer, ready to come in, be deployed for ministry among this church, which I see this morning. This morning I see a lineup of angels who are ready to join in with your life. Um, and thank, thank you for that music in the background. That, that was perfectly timed. Um, <laughs> So, I, I thought it was a little bit of that spiritual stuff, you know. <laughs> I thought, ah, oh, great, this is happening. You know, one, one day I, I went to this conference and they, this guy was, you know, praying for people for healing and then I could smell this incense, and I thought, where's that coming from? I was looking around for the, you know, you'd see a little smokestack. There was that much, it filled the room. And I went to this guy and said, what is that smell? It's, it's fantastic. It, I thought it was incense, but it's, it's sort of purer. And he said, no, it's the fragrance of the spirit. And I said, you idiot, you know, just... You <laughs> <laughs> spirit doesn't smell, you know. And, uh, and so I thought, right, I'm going to find this thing and, and hunted around and, and couldn't find the source... It had to be the Holy Spirit. Anyway, I thought that was one of those things. You know. <laughs> no, not to be. I want to pray for you. And, uh, and let's, let's pray that angels would invade your world. Um, you know, sometimes we need to give them permission. Oh, that's another thing. God is not going to just come into your life and do all sorts of wonderful stuff. You know, you're standing around thinking, why, why doesn't God do anything in my life? You know, what's wrong with me? Come on. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for your freedom. This is a real, real revelation for me. It's not just forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, not just your ticket to heaven. God provided you, God won for you on the cross, freedom. And God will not violate that for anything, even for your own good. You are free to sin. You are free to destroy yourself. You are free to wander away. God has won freedom for you. So use that freedom, not, not to you know, come under a yoke of slavery again, but to live in the full freedom that God has for you. Let's experience some of that freedom. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for that, that great gift that you've given us. And so we ask that, uh, that if it be your will, provide for us a vision of angels. Um, not least being that it would just be really nice, but also encouraging for us, Lord, who in this day, need some encouragement, some courage, some, uh, um, 
some power in our lives, in our witness, power in our worship, power in our outreach to a lost and, uh, and, and scared community. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would appoint with us, with each person here, Lord, who's willing. I would ask, Lord, that you would appoint an angel, that you would appoint your holy angels to guard and protect, but also to encourage and guide each of us who want to reach out, each of us who want to, want to encourage someone else, each of us who wants to bring about change um, and uh, healing, hope and well-being to those around us. Lord, lead us to those people who need this angel of peace that is with each one of us. Be, uh, lead us to somebody who, who will benefit from the effect of this angel of peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may. A very good question, not one that I really know the answer to. I know there are there are um, there's an angel of death in the Bible. There's there, there are warrior angels, and I'm not sure whether they are different types of angels that God's God appoints, or whether they are all one sort and God appoints for a different purpose at that time. You know, for for a season. Um, I, I sort of tend to the latter um, because they have different... Like the first angel I saw was a patrolling angel, an angel on guard. And I thought, what... Because it, it was at the dentist. And I thought, what... <laughs> yeah, my, my life is pretty, yeah, pretty exciting stuff. Um, but uh, this angel was on patrol patrolling up and down the corridor. And I thought, all right, why, why am I seeing this? And then the dentist came out, a diminutive little Chinese lady, um, about eight months pregnant. I thought, oh, that's why. You know, God had appointed an angel to guard over this lady and her unborn child. And uh, so I told her that. I waited till after the consultation. <laughs> like, you you don't want some Twitter-pated dentist to go, oh, I'm so excited about the angel. Just focus on my tooth, please. <laughs> but, mm. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, or jokes? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, look, that, that reading that says he, he has appointed his angels to take care of you, y yes, that's for Jesus, but also it, was, it wasn't meant, like it wasn't written just for Jesus, it was written for the people of God. Um, and in Hebrews too, it talks about an angel appointed to guard us. So, so there seems to be um, individual angels appointed uh, now, whether that's the same one all the time, I don't know. Um, but I, I met a pastor in Canada and our, our time together was fairly short, uh, but I, I sensed by a few things that he, sh he said that he was sort of along the same kind of track as me. So I told him my story about an angel and then he told me his story about his. And uh, uh, his... Um, apprentice pastor we call them vicars over here they call them something different but his apprentice uh, had to watch his service you know his liturgy thing 
and take notes and ask him any questions. And his question was, what was the other guy doing? <laughs> he said, what other guy? The guy that was following you around all the time. Why was he there? Describe him to me. <laughs> and he was rather large and silver. He was in armour. So we had the same kind of angel tracking around after us. And this, this poor apprentice had no idea what was going on. He, he had no idea he could see in the spirit, but there you go. Yes? I find it very reassuring to know that only a third of, of um, Satan, uh, only a third of the angels have Satan, yeah. are looking at the priest, you know, there's two angels for everyone in the That's right, yeah. Yeah. And I think part of the... Part of the problem in the church today is that the devil gets his way because we don't know anything about angels. Yeah. Yep, we, we, um, uh, we get swamped by the devil. We don't know how to do it. We, we try harder. We read the Bible more. We pray more. We, we ask God for help. We tr even try and lean into worship. It still doesn't work because what we don't realise is that the, the devil has set up uh, a little plan, a trap for us. He's been working at it for a long time and, uh, and finally got us cornered and we're not calling on angels to help us. And they're all standing around waiting, well, I'd help if, it, you know, I'm not going to force myself. You know, the devil forces him his way in wherever he can. You know, he lies and kills and cheats, whereas an angel does things God's way. You have freedom, you know. I always, I always wonder the same thing. <laughs> yeah, we're not told. Well, I haven't been told anyway. Let me know when you find out. <laughs> Any other, other questions? married for 27 years and this year is the 27th year that I haven't had my wife. So I looked that up in the, I thought somebody told me to look on Google. So I Googled it and apparently the 27 means, according to them, means that there are angels are pleased with me and they are looking after me. Okay. So that's just a comment on what you just said. All right. I'm sorry, but it mean, means no such thing. But uh, <laughs> what, uh, what does mean that the angels are pleased with you or that God is pleased with you is because you are a child of God. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you have been appointed as his child and heir. And, uh, and whatever any other numerology might say about you, um, that's your claim to fame, <laughs> is your, your heavenly crown rather than your numerical one. I just want to say that I married an angel. Yeah. <laughs> I I took a funeral once. This guy. This guy. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't mean to. <laughs> but anyway, in the, this guy wrote his own eulogy, right? And he started off. Yeah, I'm sitting here with my dog and a glass of port. And so then he wrote his his eulogy. And, uh, and he'd been an amateur boxer and he said, I had 32 fights and none with Netta. And, uh, and then he went on to, to describe his wife, you know, the widow sitting there as, as an angel and uh, things like that. And I said, yeah, still, still scoring points from the grave. You know, <laughs> but but so, so well done. And, <laughs> but <laughs> let me tell you, points evaporate. <laughs> I want to know what happened to my 500 million. <laughs> I, I had that many. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> uh, 
Any other questions? Smart comments? <laughs> um, I just gave a funeral once where it was actually said that um, in the eulogy that the person who, who died is now an angel. And you see that in the commercial. Yeah. This, um, one of our lecturers, uh, um, John Kleinig, you had him, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. He would, did he do this to you? He, there was this one, one guy down the back said something and he, he wandered across the front of the classroom going, mm, absolute sanctimonious waffle. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's, and I feel like doing that. I feel like Kleinigging people who... who uh, <laughs> who say things like that because, yeah, up there looking down on us. Yeah, look, if, they're a, if they were a Christian all their lives, they're not interested in looking down on you. they got some fantastic stuff to catch up on now. And if you were any kind of friend, you would not want them to be looking down on you. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd want them just to be doing their thing up there because that's going to be fantastic. And if they weren't Christian, well, they ain't looking down on you. Um, and that's, yeah, that sort of stuff keeps me awake at night too. But anyway, there's, I, I needed to bless somebody. Who was that? The lady playing the piano, your, the, your, your, instant, your instant pianist. Um, yeah. Look, I, I don't know why, but God bless you. And may, may his presence be with you and watch over you. Uh, and may your angel uh, now with you uh, bless and keep you and keep guard over you and whatever you need. Amen. God bless. Um, all right. I, okay. I can bless a lot of you. Okay, not just you. I'll bless all of you. May God bless you. May God watch over you with his holy angels. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favour and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Um, now, what do you do now? Do you do you have the, the sacrament? We all buy your book. Yep. <laughs> the, as in coffee, like yeah. coffee yeah. is the third oh. sacrament. Yeah. So as, as we participate in the third sacrament, um, uh, if there's anyone who would who particularly needs to chat about something, then please feel free to come and have a chat. And. Um, uh, Yes, and I can bring you a word of peace, whoever that's for. Oh, this um, Joy's book will be out there, but, but I've snuck a few of mine in as well. Um, <laughs> and we, cause we haven't talked about that. That's about evangelism. So th um, and that's a whole other topic. So if you're interested in that, I can come back another yeah. Sunday and talk about that. Like that. Yeah. Um. Hang on, I'll change.